Hello, I'm Joseph Burris, or Color Me Impressed, from the Context Free Forums, with the first in a series of video tutorials on how to use Context Free. Before we get started, I want to point out the menu bar at the bottom. This is a chapter selection bar. Each picture shows what you make during that chapter, or an image of what's going on in that section. Feel free to skip around as you like. Finally, a link to the final code of each chapter can be found below in the video description. Please relax and have fun learning this generative art program. Context Free is a free generative art program that uses code to create images. So, what's generative art? Generative art is art generated by an autonomous non-human source. In general, generative art is made by computers. Context Free allows us to create semi-random artwork by letting us add random elements to our designs. You can create complex images and animations with just a few lines of code with Context Free. It excels at making mathematically simple designs and quickly making variations of them, something that is very hard to do otherwise. Context Free really fills a certain niche in creating artwork, but if it fits what you want to do, it's really fun. If you don't know whether you like it or not, or you're not sure how interested you are in generative art, watch the tutorial to find out. You can download Context Free from contextfreeart.org under the Download tab. It's available for Windows, Mac, and Linux. Just run the installer and open the program to get started. You should see a design that says Welcome surrounded by two vines when you open the program. That's the Welcome design that opens by default. You might want to check it out sometime on your own, but we're going to start from scratch for this tutorial. Go to File, click New to open a blank document, and we're ready to start. The way Context Free works is by drawing shapes. Context Free has three basic shapes built in. Type Start Shape, then a space, then Square in all caps, followed by two square brackets. Then click the Render button. By writing Start Shape, then a shape, Context Free draws that shape when you click Render. If there's a problem with your code, Context Free will let you know in the bottom left hand corner when you try to render your design. Anyway, Square is the first of the three basic shapes. Change it to triangle, and it'll make an equilateral triangle. Change it to circle, and you get a circle. These are the three basic shapes included in Context Free. We're going to be mainly using squares throughout the tutorial, but it's good to know what you're working with. Now that we have that down, let's move on to making our own shape. To make a shape, type shape followed by the shape's name. We'll make a shape called tree because that's what we're going to make in this tutorial. Now we got a shape, let's give it a rule. Type rule, then open a curly brace. Next line, type square in all caps again, followed by square brackets. And close the rule with another curly brace. Change the start shape line to say tree instead of circle. And click render. The rule tells the shape what to draw. By putting another shape in there, a square this time, context tree will go and draw that shape when we click render. Let's add another rule right below this one. Type rule again, and open another curly brace. Type triangle this time in all caps, followed by square brackets, and close the rule. Click render a few times, and it'll render both triangles and squares. Both these rules belong to the shape tree. When a shape has multiple rules, a rule is chosen at random to be drawn. In this case, tree can either draw a square or a triangle. This is the first big part of context free randomness. Well, just making squares and triangles is okay, but it's not much. We need to be able to manipulate them some. Let's get rid of the second rule for now so we only have to deal with squares. Copy and paste the square line to make a second square, then click render. Looks like there's no change, but in the upper right, context free says it rendered two shapes. It's just that they're on top of each other. We need to be able to move one out of the way so we can see both of them. In the first one's brackets, type X1, then render. It now shows a 2 by one rectangle. We move the top square right one unit. The basic squares are one by one, so we can see a rectangle now. Now add Y1 to it also, then render. They're touching at the corners. That moves it up one unit. Now we can see the two separately. These modifications to the square shape are called shape adjustments. 
There are a lot of different shape adjustments, and we won't go into full detail of all of them in this tutorial, but we'll touch a good number of them. The next one on the list to introduce is the size adjustment. That same one, type S.5, then render again. This modifies the box's size by a factor of 0.5, so now it's half the size. Finally, the last one to introduce for now is the rotation adjustment. Type R15 into the box, then render it. This rotates the box 15 degrees counterclockwise. With a few of these shape adjustments under our belt, we're now one tool away from having our tree take shape. Recursion. Recursion is the heart of what makes context free an elegant way to make complex designs. Let's think for a second what would happen if we changed our first square to something else. Another tree. Well, we'd start with one tree, which makes a square. Then we move up one and right one and shrink it and rotate it. And we get a new tree, which makes a new square. Then we move up one and right one, shrink it and rotate it, which makes a new tree, which makes a new square. And then so on and so on and so on. We get infinitely smaller and smaller rotated trees. We get a spiral of squares. Let's click render and try it out. We get a spiral right on target. This is called recursion. When you have an equation or an algorithm or a piece of code that calls itself while inside it. Pretty neat, right? Notice the upper right, the shape counter says it only drew about 9 or 10 shapes. Context Free will stop drawing a shape when it gets too small. Now, we still actually have a few issues with recursion. Try setting the size adjustment to 1.5 and render it, and you get an error in the bottom left. Shape got too big. Well, that kind of makes sense if we have a square, which makes a, another square, which makes another square, and these are bigger and bigger and bigger. We just get infinitely big squares, and we can't draw an infinitely big square. So, yeah, we get an error. We get a similar problem if we make the size adjustment 1. Instead of getting an error, if you click a render, it'll just keep making more and more and more and more squares. Because it'll just move and rotate, move and rotate, move and rotate. It never gets too small enough for it to stop. It'll just keep going on forever. Well, that's bad. So if you click render when you do that, you'll have to click stop by clicking render again. Then it'll wait, wait it out to render all the other squares that processed. But you can end that early by clicking stop now. So now we have all the tools to make our tree. Let's get to making it. So let's start making a tree. What do trees look like? Well, they have a trunk, and the trunk has some branches, and the branches have branches, and those branches have branches, and so on, and so on. So if we take the trunk as just another branch, we have our blueprint for the tree. We draw a big branch, which is branches coming off it at all different places. So, let's completely reset our current tree to just a square. This will be the base of our tree. Add below it tree s.99 y.995. By making smaller squares on top of our original squares, we get a narrow sliver of a tree trunk. Now, let's add another rule. Copy the first one, then paste it, and add tree r90 s.8. Try rendering it for a second, and you'll see we're getting way too many secondary branches. When we were playing with the randomness with the squares and the triangles earlier, you may have noticed that each rule has a 50% chance to occur. We need to make the first rule more likely to occur than the second one instead of what we have right now. We can actually weight the rules. Add 20 to the first rule between the word rule and the curly brace. Do the same thing for the second rule, except add a 1 instead of a 20. This makes the first rule's likelihood 20 times greater than the second rule. This will prevent the tree from growing too many branches and slowing down your computer with shapes to render. Not to mention it'll look better. Click render now. You get a, a tree-like thing. It's not a tree, but it's a start. It's pretty cool though. Try hitting render a few times to see some different variations of it. Next, trees aren't just straight. They curve some. Let's add in a rotation element to both the main tree shapes, say, R2. Render it, and we get some spirally tree thing. Too curly. Time to introduce a new shape adjustment, flipping. 
add a new rule that's a copy of our first rule, except add the adjustment F90 to it. What the flip adjustment does is flip the shape along a line cutting through the center of the shape that has an angle of input value with the x-axis. For instance, flip 0 would flip across the x-axis, flip 90 would flip across the y-axis, and flip 45 would flip across the line y equals x. So, by adding a rule with F90 in it, you flip the tree every so often, so it's still curvy, but it'll just curve back and forth instead of being a spiral. Tone the rule's probability down to about 8 from 20. Render it, and we can still see some problems with the branches. The branches poke off at 90 degree angles, which is much too awkward for a tree. Let's try to change the rotation to about 10 from 90. Render it, the result's pretty tree-like. We're getting there. Let's change the branching rule. How about instead of a main branch and a secondary one, we have two equal sized branches. This will make the whole tree look much more balanced than it does right now. For our tree to look like it branches properly, we ought to have one side mirrored as the other side. Well, we have a bit of syntax that can help us do that. Take our secondary branch, and then put double square brackets around it. This makes all adjustments we put into it go in order. So, we want to shrink it first, down to 0.8, rotate it, 10 degrees, then move it up. When we move up after we rotate, the new squares will start off at an angle, making the branching look nicer. Now, copy this shape and paste it. Add F90 in between the size adjustment and the rotation. Now this shape is a copy of the last shape, except we just flipped it across the y-axis. Why do we have to use the double brackets? Well, context-free is a default way of processing the adjustments. If we don't use the double brackets, it'll flip the square last. This means that our branching squares wouldn't be branching at all. They'd actually be on top of each other, except one would just be flipped. Test it out to check. Try rendering our tree with these new changes, and it looks wider now in general, and more balanced. But we still have one last rule to add. Copy the splitting rule and change the size adjustments from 0.8 down to 0.5. Then add in tree S.99, Y.995, F90. This rule extends the main branch while adding two little sub-branches. The flipping part makes it more straight here. It's not super necessary, but I think it ends up looking slightly better with that part in, in my opinion. Try rendering it and playing around with the probabilities on the rules. I like them with 20 on the main rule, 8 on the flip rule, 2 on the triple split, and 3 on the double split. Render it and it now looks like a bona fide tree. But there's one last trick to this design that makes it really stand out. And to do it, we have to introduce two more adjustments. First is the brightness adjustment. This is our first color adjustment. Here's how it works. The brightness adjustment changes the shape's brightness by a factor either towards pure white or pitch black. So a brightness adjustment of B1 will make something black white, while one of B.5 will make something black gray. The opposite is true for negative values, which makes shapes more close to brightness zero, or black. Here's the kicker though. When you recurse it with B.5, let's say, it always gets halfway closer each time, halfway closer and halfway closer until it looks almost exactly white. So, when branches get smaller, let's make it a bit brighter. The little ones by 0.07, the big ones by 0.01. This will make the branches have a fading effect into the background. But try it out and there's a problem. The bright and dark blocks will end up overlapping wrong, but we can fix this with our final shape adjustment. The final shape adjustment is the Z adjustment. Shapes with higher Z value are on top. Those with lower Z values are on bottom. Add negative Z values proportional to the brightness adjustments, so we get Z negative 0.07 on the little ones and Z negative 0.01 on the big ones. Render it, and we're done with our tree. Now that we're done with our tree, we need to save it as an image. But first, a few last odds and ends. Click on the render menu at the top and select render to size. 
We can set the pixel dimensions of our picture here if we want. Context Free normally renders the images too small to be desktop backgrounds or anything large like that, so we can fix that here. Next, there are the border options. A negative border cuts off some of the picture when you render it. The None option makes it so that the image is cropped as tight as possible, while the last two options give a bit of a buffer zone between the picture and the image border. But the most important thing in this menu is the size of smallest element box. This lets you control the cutoff for the renderer when a shape gets too small. Smaller values mean more detailed images, but take much more computing power. I keep mine around a minimum of 0.3 usually. The more important thing is that by making the minimum size really big, say 1, 2, or 3, it makes it faster and cheaper on your computer to speed through different variations to find one you like. When you find one, be sure to note the letters on this bar right here. This is the code for that variation. By setting that code there, you can reproduce your favorite randomly generated designs. Don't worry about running out of letter combinations either. There are several million different possibilities, so you won't be running out anytime soon. Once you find the variation you want to save, just click the Save Picture button to save it as either a JPEG or a PNG. Thanks for watching the first of my context free tutorials. If you need help using context free, you can check out the documentation on the context free website at contextfreeart.org. If you have any other problems, sign on and ask on the forums or PM Color Me Impressed. Don't hesitate to share your best creations at the gallery either. See you next time.